This week in Starbase, we've had ships and boosters moving up and down Highway 4. We had a test tank go pop. We have loads of future vehicles under construction and, well, Booster 9 lost its crown. Howdy, Star fans. I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. Let's start off this week at the Massey's test site, where Booster 10 had been enjoying some cryogenic proof testing on the thrust simulator stand. I'm, I'm not kidding, the script says enjoying. I, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't enjoy being super cold and having my backside pushed on really hard. In the previous episode, we mentioned that Booster 10 testing had started with a filling and draining of its methane tank. And since then, it's undergone two more tests. Then in the third test, Booster 10's methane tank was completely filled and then drained, and then its LOX tank was completely filled and then drained, all in the same day. Booster 10 appeared to pass these cryogenic tests with flying colors because it was disconnected from the umbilicals at Massey's and rolled back to the production site. But we'll talk about that in a minute, mostly because at Massey's this week, we also had a pretty spectacular destructive test of the Ship 26.1 test tank. This test to failure occurred on what we informally call the burst site. This site is safely away from other hardware and tucked in a corner of the little island where Massey's gun range was formerly located. So it's an ideal location to perform these sorts of tests. This is where SpaceX tested the new flight termination system on another different tank a few months back. But unlike that test tank, which was destroyed by explosive charges, this tank was popped the old fashioned way. Fill it full of cryogens, close all the valves, and let the pressure build until it pops. Now we don't really know what SpaceX was testing with the Ship 26.1 test tank. It was kind of a weird amalgamation of a ship aft section and dome and a booster forward section and dome. Honestly, like most test tanks, it was kind of an abomination. It might just be that SpaceX is testing some structural improvements for the ship aft section, and they slapped a spare booster forward dome on it just to have a way to test it. Or it could be the other way around. This test article could have been to test design changes on booster forward dome sections. And they used a spare ship aft section they had laying around the production site. Really, it could be one or the other or something else we haven't thought of, or all three. Who knows? Well, SpaceX does, of course. But for us, it's hard to say. Either way, it's really nice to see one of these tanks go pop every now and then. It really reminds me of the old tank watching days. Now, let's go back to Booster 10. As I was saying, right after it completed its cryogenic proof testing, it was then rolled back to the production site and went into the mega bay. At the mega bay, the booster was lifted off of the thrust simulator stand and then placed on the stand that we believe might be for engine installation. For situational awareness, this stand is located in the southwest corner of the building. Remember that mystery white stand that was built at the Sanchez site and then moved into the mega bay? Yep, that's the one. It's going to be kind of hard to know now what kind of work will be done on Booster 10 and what sort of hardware it will get. Because it's tucked away inside of the mega bay, and frankly, it's quite hard to see what's going on. But we hope it'll get engines and shielding and all the bits and bolts needed to get into static fire testing once the pad is cleared for that use. Another thing they may install on the booster while it's in the mega bay is the pair of massive CO2 tanks that go under two of the chines, which are used for the vehicle's fire suppression system. Now, if you're thinking right now, huh? A booster has CO2 tanks? Yes. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, maybe go watch our recent video on design changes between the last flight and this one on the ship and booster. It's a really great video and we talk about the CO2 tanks in a fair amount of detail, so check it out. We saw these two tanks packed up and ready to go outside the shipping and receiving tent at the Sanchez site. For reference, this is located more or less across Remedios Avenue behind the mega bay. Given all this, it wouldn't be surprising to see them move these to the mega bay and have them installed at the same time as they work on Booster 10's engine section. Speaking of working on future boosters in the mega bay, stacking of Booster 13 is going speedily next to Booster 10. Booster 13 stacking is continuing at a great pace, with only two pieces remaining to be stacked to complete its liquid oxygen tank. That's at least at the time of recording. Maybe more of it's completed by the time you watch this. I say that because there are still quite a lot of different sections laying around the ring yard, so it wouldn't be surprising to me if SpaceX was just mere days away from fully building Booster 13. The other part of Booster 13, which is its methane tank, might be stacked soon as well, so keep an eye on Starbase Live and maybe you'll catch it. 
It's kind of mind-boggling to see that we have four completed boosters, 9, 10, 11, and 12, with a fifth coming rapidly down the pipeline. You can definitely tell that here in Starbase, the machine that builds the machine is running at full steam. And on that same note about SpaceX's Starship assembly line, Ship 31 stacking is also continuing inside the high bay. There, the ship is almost complete, and it's only missing its engine section. So just to underscore this point about the machine that builds the machine, we now have a ton of ships stacked and ready to go. 25, 26, 28, 29, 30, and now 31 will be joining their ranks. That's six ships, that's insane. But stacking is just one phase of the life of a ship, and it's probably the easiest. The hardest part is having to do all the little work installing heat shield tiles, installing engines, all of the engine shielding, all of the plumbing, and well, you get the point. A lot of that work happens right after stacking, and that's where Ship 30 is right now in its life cycle. Ship 29 is now one step ahead of that and has been rolled out to Massey's for cryogenic proof testing. That's the first testing that ships see in their life. But before it's moved to Massey's, Ship 29 has had a lot of work done on it. I mean, you can see clearly the quality of its tiles, and if you pay close attention, the crane lifting points on the nose cone have been removed and tiled over. Now you may remember that this typically happens much later in a ship's life cycle, typically as it's being prepared for launch. That's what happened with Ship 24, and that's what happened with Ship 25 as well. This is mostly because by then, the ships would not need to be lifted by a crane anymore, and only lifted by the chopsticks. But this time, the reason why they did this was precisely because the ground crews will not need to use the good old lifting squid anymore. In the past few weeks, SpaceX teams have been building a new two-point lifter that uses the same interfaces used by the chopstick pins to lift ships. Now, SpaceX did build one of these two-point lifters and test it out a few months ago, but it didn't really work too well. Cough, cough, it broke a bunch of tiles on the ship. Cough, cough. Sorry, I don't, I don't know what's in my throat today. With this new two-point lifter, the crews were able to use it to lift Ship 29 up from its transport stand and onto the thrust simulator stand, all without any issues. And after that, Ship 29 was rolled out to Massey's. Coming back to those lifting points, you can see that the holes where the crane attachment points were located have not only been covered, but also that a metallic cover has been welded to the airframe of the ship. That basically means there's no hole anymore, and there's no way they can return back to having those lifting points. SpaceX must be very certain this new two-point lifting rig won't cause any problems. Ship 29, however, wasn't the only thing rolling out to Massey's this week, as we had yet another test tank. Yes, another one. This one consists of a tank section with two E-domes, or elliptical domes, on the top and bottom. Now, what are they going to test with this tank? Your guess is as good as mine, but logically, something with elliptical domes would make sense. Because, you know, it's, it's got elliptical domes. Moving right along, at the Rocket Garden, Ship 28 is still being worked on as it sits on the engine installation stand. You can clearly see that over the last few weeks, it's received some rather interesting hardware on its nose cone section. For example, near the tip of the nose cone, a set of covers has been put in place over the header tank vents, making them look like the cowbell vents that we see on the common dome section of boosters and also on ships. This was a design change which we had already seen on Ship 31's nose cone, so it appears that this is a retrofit for this vehicle. You can also see this set of black square patches a little bit lower on the ship. These weren't even there last week. We did see preparation work for these, but we were certainly not expecting this kind of hardware to be installed. We don't really know what they might be for, but they could be protecting Starlink antennas underneath them. They might also be protecting some sensors or some other kind of antenna. Just like everything else in Starbase, we can tell you what we see and make some conjectures, but there's not really a solid explanation. Besides those changes on the nose cone, a ton of work is still ongoing on the payload bay section and Ship 28's two main tanks. So maybe it's going to be a little bit before it comes off the engine installation stand. And that's honestly not surprising given the amount of scaffolding around the vehicle. Now, if you've been paying attention up to this point, you're probably starting to notice a theme. SpaceX is working on a ton of future ships and boosters, but they're also working on the machine that builds the machine with some serious upgrades. and. This is really important. The massive footprint expansion of the Star Factory building has now reached Highway 4, and groundwork is well underway to expand it further southwest where the mid-bay was previously located. We can see that now a lot of the north side of the building is almost completed, with walls and roof covers having been installed. 
while the side closer to the road is now receiving roof beams and some final wall columns. Now, if you're wondering why this section of the building is taller, that's to be able to fit nose cones inside that part of the building. This leaves the rest of the building free to do other parts like tank domes, barrel sections, you name it. And that's why Tent 3 hasn't been demolished yet. This section of the Star Factory needs to be completed before the work from Tent 3 can be moved inside of it. But as soon as that happens, sayonara Tent 3. Now at this point, I'm sure some of you are like, yeah, 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 but what's happening at the launch site? So let's head there. Ship 26 has had quite a lot of work done inside of its tanks lately, but earlier in the week, the crane was disconnected and it seems like that work is now on pause. However, it could be that the reason the crane was disconnected from Ship 26 has less to do with something with Ship 26 and more because the crane had something more important to do. And that is remove the hot stage ring from Booster 9. That's right, Booster 9 has lost its crown. But maybe by the time you watch this, it'll already be reinstalled. Who knows? So don't worry, don't panic. Everything's gonna be okay, maybe. But I'll tell you why we don't think this is the hugest deal. Since they removed the hot stage ring from Booster 9, we've seen workers go onto the forward dome of Booster 9 and do some work there. We've even seen their hard hats poking out from the top of the booster, so they've clearly been doing some work on Booster 9's forward dome or something in that area. Now, this could be because they want to perform some extra work here, and as you can imagine, with the hot staging ring in the way, they can't access it. So by removing it, now they can. Similarly, maybe they had some work that they wanted to do to the hot stage ring itself, like some reinforcements or who knows what, and that would give them two times the reasons to remove it. In any case, I don't really think it's a reason to panic. It could be reinstalled the next days or weeks, and like I said a moment ago, it could already be reinstalled by the time you watch this. I mean, I'm recording it on Saturday, you're gonna watch it on Monday, so we all know SpaceX is not waiting around here. Either way, in the next days and weeks, I'm sure it'll get placed back atop Booster 9, and we'll see a full stack again soon. This week, we've also seen a lot of work ongoing on Booster 9's engine section, with scaffolding being set up on the OLM dance floor. So as you can see, SpaceX appears to be doing quite a lot of work on Booster 9 still, even after Elon deemed it ready on Twitter. If you remember from last week, we talked about how Starbase General Manager Kathy Loiters said that they were still working on regulatory approval, but she also said that there was still some work left to do that they wanna get done before fully signing off on the hardware for flight. Given those comments and given what we're seeing, I say this is all very much aligned. On the regulatory side, which I'm sure you're all very curious about, NSF had reached out to the FAA and the Fish and Wildlife Service to get some comments on what's going on, but these comments also sort of raised some more questions. The FAA said that it, quote, is optimistic it may complete the safety review of the license application by the end of October. Now, we don't really know if that's the last step to get the modified license or not, or if there are more steps in the way, but we'll definitely report on that if we hear anything. On that same note, the FAA said that due to modifications being done to the Starship program, also known as ships, vehicles, and ground systems, that an additional environmental review would be necessary. We already kind of expected this extra review where SpaceX and the FAA try to cross all the T's and dot all the I's and make sure that the flight itself doesn't stray much from the environmental assessment that was performed in 2022. A similar thing happened for Flight 1, after all. At the end, it connects to what the Fish and Wildlife Service then talked about as well, which was that as part of that review, in August, the FAA sent a letter and draft biological assessment to the Fish and Wildlife Service to basically look into these changes. In particular, the effects they're considering are related to the new water deluge system, which, to be real, makes sense given the sheer amount of water used and, honestly, sprayed all over the wetlands. Part of the agency's comment also mentioned that they have 135 days to issue a final biological opinion. And I know, I know, that sounds like the end of the world, but that's only at first. When you think about it, the reality could be that this process does not take the entire 135 days, and that's just the upper bound of time it could take. That said, on the flip side, Fish and Wildlife could come back to SpaceX and the FAA and say they need even more time. But hopefully that's not the case since this review has been underway for well over a month now, and hopefully there's not a lot of work remaining. I'm sure a lot of you are super excited to see this flight, and I sure am too. But 
there's going to be loads more flights of the Starship program. So it's good to get this stuff out of the way from hardware to paperwork and everything else. That is, at least until SpaceX changes a bunch of things and we have to go through the whole process over again. So to sum it all up, as we've talked about in this video, there is a load of work going on, not just for IFT2, but also for all the future flights of Starship. This is not a sprint. It's a marathon, and it doesn't matter how it starts. It matters how it continues. And there's lots of potential for excitement, literally right around the corner. So you know the YouTube spiel. Subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, do all the things so we can continue to bring you the exciting future of spaceflight 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All right, that's gonna be it for this one. We'll see you next week. And until then, don't forget, be excellent to each other.